<clears throat> there we go. Okay. Over to you, Paripurna. Namo Midabu. Namo Midabu. Thank you very much. I, what a great weekend it's been so far. I just, uh, those bits I've managed to get to, it's just fantastic. And um, I've got a, another bit of raw honing, as Sam Allen would say. Uh, <laughs> Coming up, it is his birthday. It is his birthday. I, I was going to work out how, what number birthday it was. If he's born eleven thirty three, perhaps somebody could could work it out. I, I don't know. Anyway, I wanted to um, focus a, a little bit about um, Honan's time in exile, which is not often spoken about, I suppose, because it's thought of as being a kind of not very significant part of his life because he'd already um, uh, founded Jodo Shu in 1175. Uh, he'd already written, put together his collection on the Nembutsu. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the key part of a lot of his kind of work was done in a way. But he had a lot of problems um, with his followers. Uh, in February 1207, I can't it's a disaster really, but the practice of exclusive Nambutsu recitation was banned uh, by the emperor. And it's, you know, it's quite horrific. How, how exactly he would have enforced that, I, I don't know, but it was banned. And Honan was returned to lay status. Officially, he was no longer a Buddhist priest. Uh, they even changed his name to Fuji Motohiko. I shall continue to refer to him as Honan, of course, but quite a disaster for him. Um, and he was exiled. Initially, the plan was to exile him to the, the island uh, province of Shikoku um, and he, he went to a number of places around there during his time of exile and he ended up uh, in Osaka back on, on the mainland. Um, difficult to track his movements, different sources do different things. Shinran was exiled at the same time but he was exiled North Central Honshu on the, on the Japanese mainland, if you like. Um, the actual exile uh, didn't last very long because if February 1207 uh, was when the, the, ex the official exile started, by December 1207, uh, the emperor had rescinded his exile, but he was denied permission to return to the capital, to Kyoto. So in effect, his exile didn't end until August 1211, when he was permitted to uh, re-enter Kyoto. Uh, now, you've got to be careful about some of the accounts that are, are written about this, because uh, they're obviously very, all the sources we have are very pro Honan. Uh, and uh, he's... In these sources, it's said that he's kind of um, uh, greeted rapturously wherever he goes by huge numbers of people and massive applause and so on and so forth. And perhaps he was, perhaps he wasn't. But I just want to draw three things out from what happened to him during his years of exile. And these are kind of personal observations. And I think it's, it's always instructive to look at the narrative accounts we have of these great Buddhist teachers and, and try and uh, try and relate to them, trying to find a way of engaging with them. And the first way I've kind of found of engaging with Honan's story at this point in his life was that um, it must have been traumatic for him. I mean, he'd already had trouble earlier in 1204 uh, three years before his exile, uh, when, as is well known, um, protests at the behaviour of some of his followers were were, were lodged, uh, complaints were lodged by 
Tondai Buddhists uh, with, with the emperor. And Honan wrote this, these instructions to his followers about how to behave. And I suppose he thought that was problem solved. But then you have this famous incident in 1206 where two of his supporters were actually executed, uh, Juran and Anraku. And they were executed uh, allegedly for uh, dalliances, should we put it that way, in a delicate way, with uh, ladies of waiting of the emperor's court while the emperor was out of town. Um, these two followers of Honan are supposed to have, have misbehaved with, with these ladies and these two followers were executed. And, you know, he would have been traumatized by uh, the, the response to this when he was sentenced to exile because, when Honan was sentenced to exile, because the Nimbutsu was his life's work, you know, and um, he was 74 years old. Uh, he was used to walking around the place, uh, going on foot, uh, but he had to be carried in a palanquin, which is like a, a litter when he went into exile. Uh, he had to go across um, notoriously storm-tossed uh, areas of water on the inland sea, getting to uh, Shikoku. So it wasn't a it wasn't a piece of cake uh, to go on these sea journeys. Um, and he died not long after his return. He would return, as I said, in uh, August twelve. Uh, 11 and he died in in 1212 and it is generally kind of accepted that his period of exile took it out of him and uh, drained his energy and made him susceptible to illness and so on and so forth so that's the first reflection you know that Honan was no no stranger to suffering um the second one is that he is again according to the sources um he used his period of exile, or he always saw his period of exile, as an opportunity rather than a threat. Uh, and if I can just read you, he puts a very positive kind of spin on what is happening to him. Uh, so he, he uh, is supposed to have, uh, well, I'll, I'll read it for you. Um, do not I do not resent this penalty of exile as I am now nearly 80 years old. That's a bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> he was only 74, but there you go. Um, even if we, master and disciple, were both living in the capital, our separation in this delusive world would come soon. Um, what difference does it make where we live? When I resided in the capital Kyoto for many years to teach Nembutsu, it was long my desire to preach the Nembutsu to innocent people in the countryside. Yet my wish was never fulfilled. Now, however, thanks to imperial benevolence, I'm able to accomplish my long held wish. This is a matter of cause and effect. So he's saying, you know, I've never had the opportunity to visit this part of Japan before. How nice of the emperor to let me do this, you know. So it's, you know, he, he's a he's a glass half full kind of guy. Really, I think you could you could say on that. Um, so I think that's an important attitude. Now the other, what I want to centre my talk around is two incidents which are. Uh, alleged to have happened to Honan, or two encounters with people that alleged to ha happen to Honan during his period of exile. And they're quite famous. And I think they're, they're very kind of archety archetypal encounters. You know, in the Bible, we have Jesus meeting with certain people and curing certain people and performing certain miracles and and these two encounters with people have that kind of flavor, that kind of flavor to them. And it's almost as if people are, whoever wrote these accounts of, of Honan are saying, this is what this guy can do, you know, look at it and, uh, and believe. And they're, Two encounters which really kind of, I think, repay 
um, some thought. And the first one, the first one is, I, I'm going to read you from this wonderful book, um, Honan, Honan the Buddhist, Buddhist Saint, uh, which many of you will know. And briefly, uh, just to sum up before I read them, because I, I want to pay attention to the kind of exact wording what is said. Briefly, the, the first encounter is, is with a, um, a husband and wife who are poor fisher people and uh, are scratching a living. And as they get older, come to think, uh, what have we done? You know, we've spent all our all our professional lives, as it were, uh, killing sentient beings. This is going to have some terrible karmic consequence um, for us. And, and they ask Honan what they can do. Uh, the second um, incident is uh, about what the account says, and I hate this term, but it's, it's, it's Honan's encounter with a woman of ill fame, uh, which was a prostitute. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a terribly kind of um, awfully, uh, um, just a horrible way of describing a woman. Really. Um, but anyway, that's so I'm, I'm just that's a, a kind of a bit of disclaimer. And she likewise um, is saying, look, I've I'm. I haven't led the best of lives. I am, um, you know, my my profession in, involves very unskillful uh, behaviour. Uh, this is going to really land me in one of the hells. And what can I do? And um, I just want to read you about Honan's encounter with each of these people. And listen carefully uh, to the wording. When he reached the coast of Tagasako, the province of Harima, many came with like purpose, among whom was an old couple, a man over 70 and his wife over 60 years of age, who said to him, we are fisher folk who live in these parts. From childhood, it has been our business day and night to take the lives of fish for our living. Now, as we are told that people who kill living things must go down to hell and suffer there, we want to know if there isn't some way of escaping this. Thus saying, they folded their hands before him and wept. Honan looked pityingly upon them, spoke kindly to them and said, If you but repeat the name Namo Amida Butsu, you will, by virtue of Amida's merciful vow, be born into the pure land. OK, so... That's the first one uh, of the fisher folk. Now we have uh, the other, the lady that he encounters. When Honan arrived at Muranomi Tomari in the same province, a small boat drew near carrying a woman of ill fame who said to Honan, I heard that this was your boat and I have come to meet you. There are many ways of getting on in the world, but what sin could have been committed in a former life of mine to bring me into such an evil life as this? which I seem fated to lead. What can a woman who carries a load of sin like mine do to escape and be saved in the world to come? Honan compassionately replied, your guilt in living such a life is surely great and the penalty indeed incalculable. If you can find another means of livelihood, give this up at once. But if you cannot, or if you are not yet ready to sacrifice your very life for the true way, begin just as you are and call on the sacred name. For it is for just such sinners as you that Amida Nayorai made that wonderfully comprehensive vow of his. So put your sole trust in it without the least misgiving. If you rely upon his original vow and repeat the Nembutsu, your ojo is an absolute certainty. Thus kindly taught, the woman wept for joy. And later Honan said of her, she is a woman of strong faith. She is sure to attain Ojo. Now then, I, at first sight, you may, we may think that there's, you know, not much to, to comment about that, that, you know, he's, he's come along and been kind to people. <laughs> you know, he's been the Buddhist teacher, hasn't he? He's, you know, um, but th there's quite a lot going on, I think, in these accounts. 
The first thing is they don't, Honan doesn't beat about the bush and he, he doesn't say, you know, he, he acknowledges the fact that what they are doing, their way of life is not good. You know, he doesn't say to them, oh, you know, it's all right, don't worry about it. You know, just have, have faith in Amida and, you know, you haven't got any control over your own destiny. You know, he acknowledges that it's a very, very difficult situation because they are, like the rest of us, like all of us, these people are enmeshed in the world, enmeshed in samsara. Uh, they've got to earn a living, you know, they've got to keep going. Um, their karma has deposited them in a certain place. It's tough. It's tough. You know, life is, all life is suffering. So he doesn't kind of let them off the hook. He says, yeah, you know, you're right. It's, it's not good. It's not good. But he recognizes there's very little that they can do about it. It, or he can do about it really for that matter you know um the lady's got to earn her living or starve uh the fisherman that's the way it is so he can't i think what is interesting about this and this is the point that i've been trying to explain to myself but i can't quite clarify it but he doesn't address their problems head on he doesn't um try and change the circumstances of their life so that they're doing something better doesn't take them out of that situation because he can't but what he does do and i think this is an important in this is an important factor in the light of what we talked about and what we all talked about yesterday afternoon about the nimbutsu which was so many profound thoughts coming from people what he does do is give them something else to do the nimbutsu okay not just something else to believe or have faith in, but something else to do and create better karma in another direction in their lives to compensate, as it were, for the bad karma that they're stuck with. It's kind of compensatory. And so why I said to you about concentrating on the wording it is the practice of Nembutsu and the importance of that that he emphasizes all the time. Now, there are two accounts of this sort of incident. One is the one that I've just read you now. And the other one is in this old famous favorite book that many of you have, um, uh, The Promise of Amida Buddha, Honan's Path to Bliss. Now, in the Honan's Path to Bliss version, um, when they're telling the story of this, uh, the story stops at the point where Honan has given them this advice, chant the Nimbutsu. In each case, the story stops at that point. But interestingly, in Honan the Buddhist Saint, which is the bit I read you just now, the story carries on. And I just want to read you uh, what happens after he's given them his advice. So first of all, the, the old couple who are doing the fishing, um, uh, they said, you know, we're having, a, we're having a terrible life. We've killed all these sentient beings. Hell is our destination. What can we do? Honan says, well, you know, it's it's bad news, really, but chant the Nembutsu. And then if the story finishes by saying, on hearing this, the fisherman and his wife wept for very joy. Thereafter, though they continued their fishing by day, they kept repeating the sacred name all the time. And at nightfall, on coming home, to the great astonishment of their neighbours, their voices could be heard all night saying the Nembutsu. Finally, when they came to die, it was with much composure that they realised their longing for Oja. Honan, afterwards hearing of it, said, this proves that anyone may attain Oja. Oja is birth in the Pure Land, by the way. Sorry, I forgot to remind you of that. Uh, this proves that anyone may attain Ojo by practising the Nimbutsu. Now, I love that. I love this kind of image <laughs> of these people uh, chanting um, 
chanting the Rinpoche all night uh, to the astonishment of their neighbours. I think if I chanted the Rinpoche all night, I think my neighbours would be pretty astonished as well, really. <laughs> but but you know you know the you know the thing. But the point I'm trying to well I'll, I'll come to the point I'm trying to make in a minute. Okay, so when we go back to the lady. Uh, uh the prostitute lady um what happens after he's given his, after Honan's given his advice to her um when afterwards Honan was on his way back to the capital he called at this place and inquired about her i.e the prostitute he found that from the time he had instructed her she had retired to a village near the mountains in the neighborhood and had been living there devoting herself assiduously to the practice of Nambutsu a short time after, as death drew near, it was with great mental composure that she safely accomplished her oja. On being told this, Honan said, yes, it is just as I had expected. So, interesting that, because the fishermen are still fishing, <laughs> they've got to eat, you know, even after the encounter with Honan. We don't know whether the lady of ill fame in inverted commas uh was still um you know earning a living in that way but something in her life had changed because she was now in a hut in the mountains and she too was 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 chanting the nimbutsu so what i think this teaches us really and is that there's no easy way around the suffering of our uh, in our lives. You know, um, we are trapped in by our, you know, we're trapped to a large degree by our karma, by the fact we live in samsara, in an, an imperfect world. We are trapped by this, but um, we can't necessarily change that. You know, we, we 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 can't change every element of what we do in our lives. You know, I mean. A lot of the companies that we do business with on a you know, as customers on a on a day to day basis have got dodgy financial interests, probably investing in unethical things. Very difficult to disentangle ourselves from our way of life and the things that are expected of us. But the message that Honan was saying here, as I think, is that okay, we can't. It's a bit facile to just say, oh, have faith and it'll be all right. But he's saying it's more than that. Let's try and establish through chanting the Nimbutsu some alternative karma in our lives. Something which is better, more wholesome, more productive. And who knows, eventually our lives may change in a more positive direction. So I just love these stories about, about uh, people and their encounters with, uh, with their supporters or, or with ordinary people. And the encounters are invariably with, with poor people. Um, and I think the literature on Shinran is equally replete with these sorts of examples. Um, and I think I was trying to reflect on all, it made me think about the issues in these stories, like I said, in his period in exile. Um, his period of exile, it has to be said, wasn't devastating, really. I mean, it was inconvenient, uncomfortable, but he viewed it as an opportunity rather than, rather than as a threat. Um, and... I was trying to draw in, when I was preparing this, I tried to draw all sorts of analogies with refugees and people who are sent into involuntary exile in other countries and and what had happened to them and how many of them want to turn their situation into an opportunity um, but don't get the chance to do so. Um, I loved the way Sustama yesterday, this is the final thought about this that came came to me about this. 
Um, you talked about bees, Sistama, when you and you know we we when doing the Nembutsu, we start we start um, buzzing, <laughs> if you like, and this buzzing becomes infectious and and uh, I was thinking about insects in in Buddhism because apparently there are other insects in Buddhism which have a kind of slightly less uh helpful analogy it's some of the literature on um tibetan monks have been imprisoned by chi by the chinese in in tibet um were nicknamed these monks were nicknamed locusts by their um captors because the, the clicking of their meditation beads reminded the guards of of these insects um but your example of the bees is a much more positive and helpful thing i think and the idea of us all kind of buzzing together and and that that was what that's what honan did really i, I think you know in, in going out into his period of exile into the countryside engaging with people the nimbutsu was kind of catching you know it was, it was people could hear each other buzzing and that was infectious and it's a very, very positive thing. So that really ends my reflections on Honan, except to say that as it's his birthday, I thought it was a final, very final thing. Um, he was given various, although he'd been exiled by the emperor on this occasion, later on, he became revered <laughs> by, by emperors who, followed on and he was given Honan was given there's been given a number of titles uh by imperial decree after his death so i would say the i'm going to say happy birthday to him i'm going to say happy birthday to and these are some of the some of the titles he was given the great illuminator the perfect light the great disseminator of the east he of highest wisdom he of comprehensive enlightenment the benign instructor and the bright illuminator. And I think that's like I like to see him as the bright illuminator. Namo Amida Boo. Thank you so much. Namo Amida Boo.